Why are they here? Why are they here? We ask and require that you acknowledge the church as the ruler and superior of the whole world. And the queen, there are the 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 and in his the name, the king Bruce. and the queen, lacking in civilized ways like all Indians, Indians, all Indians. The faces, they're upside down, they're up on the cheese, furry the faces, moyun the what, pay and meat. Que es lo que quiera. What do you want? Savages. They go about the making the of dominion over them and their, their land. It is our duty to bring them to the true power. Oba. Chamioki. Me pawichi. Oma pushun oyan. Me on obacha koyan. Alone beach below. Alone beach lakuchi. Podemos enriquecernos? Aquí hay oro. I'm so hungry. What is that? Oh, it's delicious. They might be powerful. They have so much. They are well formed and vigorous, and we are weak from the journey. Will they attack us? They are crafty people. Want? We want to trade. They, want they want to want to want to want nothing. nothing. Where are their gifts? Give the natives to understand that there is a god in heaven and the emperor on the earth. Beats. Are they and they will so little seem to have great value here and preserve. They have sticks that make fire and a terrible noise. No tienen armas ni de hierro ni de acero. It's a big white bird floating on the ocean. Con todo, ellos navegan los mares con gran peligro. Made of spheres of grass. So I'm here at the Oakland Museum of California. This is our history gallery and one particular special exhibit. Uh, this is a uh, late 17th century Spanish uh, soldier's helmet. And this is a uh, actually a contemporary Native American top knot made from pelican and duck uh, feathers made by a local Native American artist. And here we are depicting, of course, the early encounters between these two peoples, these two cultures, um, Spanish explorers and soldiers encountered the Native Americans of California and um, basically thought of them as being childlike because they had no written language, they just did not need, uh, find a use for one, did not develop one, and also did not develop agriculture because uh, they had a very sophisticated system of hunting and gathering that uh, semi-nomadic and uh, they'd figured out all the seasons and they knew how to manage the, the natural environment around them. So uh, didn't have settled agriculture and the uh, Spanish considered them um, therefore childlike and, and uncivilized and in need of both Christian faith and uh, civilized ways. Of course, unknown to the uh, Spanish at the time, they, um, the Native Americans had no native immunity to smallpox and um, measles and such, and so in bringing various things to uh, what they considered the New World, the Spanish brought not only Christian faith, but also brought uh, you know, disease and diseases and, uh, and uh, that wiped out about half the population of uh, native California. Uh, later after the mission in Rancho period, the Americans came along and very much wanted the land here. Um, here's a gold rush era uh, cigar store Indian. This particular piece is rather controversial here in the museum because it's, of course, a, a fairly offensive stereotype of a Native American. There's actually just about nothing about her right down to the shape of her nose that's uh, actually very Native American, but, uh, but that was the stereotype at the time, of course. And uh, right down to the American period when, uh, hi there, when, uh, you know, we actually had state-sponsored uh, campaigns against the Indians. 
These are some artifacts from the Modoc War uh, in Northern California, the last armed, major armed conflict with Native Americans. And uh, this particular item on the wall is actually a State of California bond. This is not just inadvertent uh, disease, this is not just chance encounters between settlers and Native Americans. This, that was state-sponsored uh, extermination uh, back in the, about a decade after the gold rush as Americans you know, sought to settle uh, California. And really the only thing in their way was, uh, <laughs> was Native Americans. So all this uh, as an introduction to the video I'm asking you to watch, the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous Peoples, uh, documenting the 1996 gathering in New Zealand, hosted by the um, indigenous peoples there, the Maori. Some of you are familiar with the Maori from uh, perhaps the um, movie uh, Whale Riders with Keisha Castle Hughes, and uh, you know before she went on to uh, play Mary actually in the Nativity Story. Uh, whale riders um, and uh, some years before that the movie uh, Once Were Warriors perhaps some of you saw that a rather uh, uh, grim look at uh, contemporary Maori culture so I'm looking for a spot that's relatively quiet here in the museum um, so this World Christian Gathering of Indigenous Peoples the idea of gathering together believers from you know, indigenous peoples all over the world, all different complexions, um, including, um, you know, folks like the Sami of that live up above the Arctic Circle. These are the folks who, um, they herd reindeer, yeah, <laughs> the Laplanders. And uh, indigenous uh, to uh, that part of Scandinavia. And then, um, uh, peoples from all over the world, including Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Native Taiwanese, the hill people, mountain people of Taiwan, and so on. And the idea, of course, is to celebrate these cultures as good gifts from God, to say and express and affirm that we believe that God is too big to be uh, uh, expressed or depicted or celebrated in just one culture, certainly any majority, just one majority culture, but we need all these different cultures in order to uh, express the, uh, the, you know, all the different aspects of the beauty of God and God's creation. So quite a gathering there in 1996 in New Zealand, and I love the way that um, in the gathering there's a great deal of attention to protocol, yes. The, uh, the long opening sequence is the arrival um, uh, honoring the Maori Queen. Uh, at the time, she actually passed away a few years ago. But, you know, proper protocol, use, you know, of course you don't come empty-handed, you present the Queen with a gift. Um, you know, just like if you were going to visit the President, you know, having a state visit, of course you would have certain protocols that you would observe, and, you know, without which, you know, you're not honoring people, you're not treating them as valuable and important. And, worthy of respect and their cultures as worthy of uh, worthy of um, inclusion into you know full inclusion into the range of cultures in which God uh, is met and worshipped and um, uh, enjoyed uh, so the protocols um, that observed uh, the uh, the greetings, uh, and then of course all just the different cultural expressions, uh, music, dance, dress, language, um, the ways of telling the gospel story that involve different cultures, and um, those are all included. And I especially like uh, the long segment on the Maori haka. A haka actually originated as a kind of a war dance, right, a war chant. Uh, now it's mostly, you mostly see it at um, rugby games, right? Uh, but this particular haka in this documentary is uh, um, a, t a telling of the passion of Jesus and the resurrection, right? Uh, resurrection haka is just beautifully depicted there by uh, the young Maori men. 
Um, so this particular movement, uh, Great Start there in 1996, it went on to be um, regathered. Uh, the next gathering was in 1998 in Rapid City, South Dakota. So that would have been a Native American hosted gathering. Then on to Australia, Hawaii, Native Hawaiians, Sweden, uh, the Philippines in 2006, Jerusalem in 2008. And then uh, I haven't followed it since then and I get the impression the movement has really died out, uh, partly because the organizer there, uh, the main organizer, Monty Ohia, Monty Ohia, he uh, passed away in 2008, uh, age 62. A great loss to the Maori because he was not only uh, uh, part of this movement uh, in, the, in this video, but um, uh, quite a statesman, uh, politician, as well as a uh, educator, uh, major edu educational figure there in New Zealand, and a politician in the Maori, um, representing some of the Maori uh, political parties there in New Zealand. Uh, so he passed away at age 62, tragically, and um, his leadership was lost. So I, I don't know where the movement is now, but certainly the idea of attention to indigenous peoples, indigenous cultures, not only for their own sake, but what questions this, you know, highlights and raises for all cultures, you know, whether majority, minority, uh, whether indigenous cultures like these that are trying to be recovered and renewed, or whether a culture like, let's say my culture, Asian American culture, which is more, um, you know, it's not, uh, I'm not trying to get back to some ancestral Chinese culture or whatever that would be. You know, here in America, this is Asian American culture. It's more Pan-Asian. It's not just Chinese. It's more, it's Asian American, right? Um, so a more um, creatively synthesized culture. And in this regard, I'm actually inspired by um, contemporary Native Americans who in the past couple of generations have really dedicated themselves to renewing their own culture, cultures, uh, and... Um, so you have gatherings, like in a place like California, you know, you don't just have one tribe dominating. You have all kinds of tribes, not just the tribes that were here historically, but peoples from all over. Um, and actually now, the today, the Native American population of California is actually higher than it was before European contact, uh, even after having dipped as low as, uh, you know, perhaps 10% of the original population. So... Um, now, if you have a gathering of Native Americans, let's say an annual, one of the annual powwows, the Stanford powwow, one of these great gatherings, uh, you'll have all kinds of tribes represented, and they've come up with a, you know, kind of a pan, pan tribal uh, culture uh, involving, you know, a procession to start the thing and dance contests, fry bread, of course, uh, but you know, just a celebration of all different tribal cultures, and something like that, I think, is what Native Ameri or Asian America needs to cultivate um, if it's to have a future. So as you think about indigenous peoples, as you think about your own culture, you know, I wonder, well, of course, I wonder, first of all, would somebody who is indigenous, uh, you know, would, would anything going on at my church really offer anything redemptive, truth, beauty, anything that would honor their story, the story that is the story of this land, you know, that we are on, is there anything that would uh, touch them? And, and um, strike them as an expression of something true and beautiful. Uh, would it occur to them that a Christian church is the place to turn to, you know, redeem something uh, hurtful and wounding and ugly in history, uh, something that would celebrate, uh, would express God's celebration of who they are and, and their story. Here's a Native American basket. Uh, this is actually a contemporary. It was completed in 2012 by a uh, local Ohlone. Linda Yamani, her people are from the Monterey Bay area. And this basket is, we think, the first such basket, uh, ceremonial Ohlone uh, 
basket, uh, first such basket made in probably 250 years because the, you know, the art of this had been entirely lost and Linda had to go all over the world to visit, you know, the British Museum and so on to find, you know, track down the couple of dozen or fewer uh, surviving Ohlone baskets that have been collected over the past couple of centuries and study them and to learn from scratch, you know, how they were made, what designs and so on. And there it is. First Ohlone ceremonial basket to be made in you know, 250 years. And here it is, you know, celebrated. Here it is a place where that culture is celebrated and embraced. And, um, and honored. And uh, our, you know, would our churches, <laughs> our, our church is such a place. You know, not that we, of course, all need to specialize in every different culture, even indigenous cultures from wherever we're at. Uh, but wherever we're from, um, our, uh, you know, do our churches offer that to the world? Um, here's a map of, uh, so when school kids finish their tours here, we ask them to get a red dot and put it uh, where their ancestors are from. And these are all the dots from uh, this school year, which is, you know, we're about what, um, six months into this school year. And there they are. I actually met some of these kids from the Azores. <laughs> I, I had to look it up, I have to admit, I didn't remember where the Azores were. But all different peoples, all different cultures, ancestral cultures, world cultures, of course, you know, crazy mixes of cultures today, migrations, refugees. Um, and uh, including indigenous cultures. So uh, as you watch the uh, video, think about it. Uh, what does this mean for your culture? What does this mean for people? What can people bring and not bring to worship in your worship setting? In the reading, I talk about the, uh, the, the rule of self-offering, right? God really wants us to love, uh, love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, that includes who we are in our cultures, our identities, and uh, how much of that can we bring to church? You know, how much of that do people feel safe bringing to church? How much do they feel God really cares about? Um, but as well, the principle of self-offering, uh, self-sacrifice, that we also um, need to learn to set aside our own cultures, and especially if we're part of the majority culture, right? Or to whatever extent we're part of the majority culture, to set aside our own culture, to make room for minority cultures and for other people and their stories, and so that they can experience God meeting them there in their story and experiencing his grace and uh, his care there. Okay, so indigenous cultures, culture, and worship.